We're good. All right. First of all, I just want to say thank you to um, to Tammy and to Dr. Rawson and everyone else that's here from the Graduate School School of Professional and Graduate Service or Graduate Studies at Spring Arbor University. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to present. Um, largely because I learn as much through the Q&A and some of the discussion afterward as, as I'm sure you all will this presentation. As Tammy mentioned, um, just a couple of things to be aware of. I presented a couple of years ago at this and just to keep you all posted, we recently we were able to, to have a training that's required of the housing inspectors in Jackson, which is really neat. We had a, a motion go through with that, so that's a little bit of an update on the previous presentation. And as Tammy mentioned, I'm also starting to do trainings. Um, we did our first one here for about 60 counseling and social work professionals um, about a month ago. And a week from today, I'll actually be in Auburn Hills training another group of people because this is, as she mentioned, this is mandated now by the state legislature that all licensed counseling, social work, and nursing professionals receive tr some sort of training on human trafficking. The legislature lays that out and what that has to entail. So that's all sort of spelled out. How it works for those different disciplines is very sort of specific to that discipline though. Um, my presentation today will focus on the labor side of human trafficking. Often human trafficking has sort of two different uh, approaches. They look at sex trafficking and labor trafficking, all of which is under human trafficking. But this, this topic that I'll present on today has, has to do more with my dissertation research in West Michigan. Um, and what, what we were looking for was we're looking for indicators of human trafficking amongst migrant farm worker communities. So I don't know how many of you um, work with migrant farm worker communities in some capacity, or maybe you know of others who do. Uh, please feel free to pass along my information or send them to me. And I, I'm, I'm still constantly learning about this topic. And so the, the more people that I can talk with, um, the better off I, I am here. So, <clears throat> um, so there's a little bit here. The, the reason why I, I delved into labor trafficking is I think the studies of sex trafficking outnumber labor trafficking you know, by some huge amount. It's, it's something like you know, for every 100 studies, like 90 to 95 are on sex trafficking. Um, as opposed to sort of a far fewer number on, on labor trafficking. Um, and the, because there's such a gap in research, a lot of those, and we find this also just with human trafficking in general, a lot of um, those who are really sort of doing the lion's share of the work with marginalized or at-risk populations for human trafficking in Michigan, this is a new phenomenon for them. So a lot of social workers, counselors, law enforcement, healthcare professionals, teachers even, um, they're not aware of what this is. They, they may have, um, in fact, I've had a number of people was just talking to one of our grads recently um, who works in the community and said, you know, I wish I would have known about this sooner because we have had cases of this in the youth center where I work. And so it's important to learn more about this so we know what the indicators look like and we can sort of follow the appropriate reporting mechanisms. Just like many people do for for CPS and, and some of those things as well. Um, topic is indicators of human trafficking. The population is migrant farm workers. Western Michigan is as high as my aspirations were to go and interview everyone, to have the best study ever, my dissertation um, chair, as well as wise people such as uh, Dr. Randy Baxter here reminded me that the best dissertation is a done dissertation. And so we, so we, worked, we worked our way <laughs> We worked our way to, to a certain specific geographic region that was Oceana County, which, was, which is north of Muskegon. Um, and we interviewed um, 15 migrant farm workers as well as 15 professionals that worked very closely with migrant farm workers, okay? Um, and these are some of the research questions that, that, that we sort of investigated. Now these weren't necessarily the questions that we asked. We asked a number of questions that actually sort of helped us gather data to get back to answering these questions, okay? So how are these migrant farm workers recruited within their countries of origin? And that could be Mexico, Guatemala, it could be the United States, okay? Um, these migrant farm workers transported? How do their living and working conditions compare to those which were presented to them upon recruitment? At what point do they no longer have control over their situations? And are these limitations on their ability to, to freely associate with others, move or transport? Like what are some of those, those, those limitations and stuff like that? So 
these are the five questions that, that we asked, or that, excuse me, that, that we used to frame the study based on sort of where the gaps were. Um, they, they allowed us to sort of um, cross-reference what we heard with some of the, the elements of human trafficking. Okay, I've talked about this a little bit already, so I apologize for sort of the, the, the re repetition here, but 15 professionals who work routinely with migrant farm worker populations. These individuals were from, the, the way I, I accessed these, these names and these individuals were, I, I used the migrant resource councils all around the state of Michigan. In each county, there's a different migrant resource council. And so I reached out to a lot of these professionals and I asked them if they'd be willing to participate and answer a set of questions. Um, the, and then I also interviewed 15 migrant farm workers themselves in Oceana County. Well, you may say, well, how did you come about these migrant farm workers? Like, how did you just walk into their, their place of employment? No. <laughs> I, I really sort of relied on individuals who have done this work for a long time to be able to help me gain access to these, these farms because um, I, I wanted to look out for the best interests of those involved. And I also wanted to get a random sample of these individuals. So um, I, I relied on uh, pr primarily an individual um, uh, Penny Barrio, who works for the Oceana Hispanic Center. She took me to a number of migrant farm worker camps in West Michigan and introduced me to a lot of these families. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm in great debt to her. Um, majority of the interviews with professionals were conducted by phone, as many of you know. In doing a lot of this dissertation research, unless you found sort of the proverbial golden goose, there's not a lot of funding for this sort of thing. So you've got to do the best you can to save on your resources. So I got a little bit of funding from Michigan State University. Uh, but that sort of barely covered some of the expenses that go into this. So the drive time, the honorariums, and stuff like that. Um, each research subject, um, I'm sorry, all the interviews were completed with migrant farm workers were face-to-face. -face. So I, I sat in in their, their temporary migrant housing and things like that. And we had conversations over meals or, or things like that. Uh, each research subject, subject received a release in their, their preferred language, whether it was English or Spanish. I relied on um, the, the Julian Zamora Research Institute at Michigan State University to do a lot of that really technical translating. Uh, while I can get by pretty well in Spanish, um, as, as some of you may know that if you've learned other languages, uh, you, can, you do your best, but sometimes the technical language you need a little bit more help with. Um, and so, yeah, I, I needed some help from, from the, the JSRI up at Michigan State. Um, Comprehensive explanation of the study was provided to them so they knew what they were getting into. They release, um, and then the paperwork for the, inter for the professionals we sort of faxed back and forth. Um, I also sort of held that in a certain locked cabinet that provided that, their, that the interviews couldn't be correlated with the individuals and so on and so forth to protect them. Uh, because as many of us know, um, particularly for those who may not be documented or, or may not have started the process of documentation, um, there's quite a bit of risk involved to them. Okay? Um, professionals were selected based on their participation. We talked about that with the Migrant Research Councils. Professionals represented a wide variety of fields. Some, were the, some of them were administrators in businesses or educational organizations, public health professionals, social service workers, student service workers, immigration attorneys, educators. Um, Again, I, in an ideal world, you interview as many people as you can, and that's a little bit longer study, but unfortunately we didn't have enough time to do that with this or resources. Migrant farm workers were selected based on a cross-section of the population, so we had different nationalities, we had different um, times, like we had individuals who had been here for 25, 30 years, we had others um, who had, had been in the United States for, you know, just, just came that summer, right? Um, some were single, some were married, and some of them were at different farms, okay? Um, they served as a sample of convenience based on the inter interaction with, with Penny and the Oceana Hispanic Center. Um, now, one of the things that I, I would, uh, in order to collect the data um, over the phone with the professionals, I would transcribe it. Um, so I had, you know, my computer, I would transcribe the responses, you know, as in response to the questions. As far as the migrant farm workers went, um, part of the process was to ask their permission to record it so that I could then revisit it because they're speaking mostly. I had a couple that spoke pretty good English, but the other ones I, I recorded them all in Spanish and then later had to go back and, 
and transcribe them the same way I did the professionals, just translate as well, right? Um, and, then, um, and then I went through and I coded the responses based on each question, and I, I <laughs> a couple of you have taken my classes before, so maybe you know I'm, I'm big on themes. But what I, what I did basically is I went through and I, I highlighted certain topics or, or areas of importance with regard to these questions that continued to come up. And then I put those off in terms of the research questions and I assembled them as such. Um, so that's sort of the way that I categorized things and sort of moved on from there. And then basically what happened is each of those different questions became sort of like a chapter of my dissertation. Um, in terms of the design. Now the, the findings are sort of the most, I guess this is, you know, with, with, we have so, sort of little time, but, but the findings are some of the most important things. And I sort of categorize these and I'll let you go through these. Um, but one of the things that we found as far as impetus for migration um, was a lot of individuals, uh, this is, goes, sometimes it goes to force or fraud. In terms of human trafficking, you've got to prove force, fraud, or coercion. And so we looked for sort of indicators that correlated with those factors. Um, and with the force, fraud, or coercion piece, now that, that's a, a, a non-minor, okay? So for example, we had a, an individual from a local social service agency call about two weeks ago, had an individual who was 13 years old, uh, had gone missing, was on the F FBI's um, missing persons list, they kind of knew her in the system, knew that, that she had sort of met this guy who lived in Detroit. All this, uh, you know, two, fast forward two years later, she shows up again, comes back to see mom. Um, she misses Jackson and this guy's turning around on the street to make, to make money off her, right? Um, she shows up and this, this former student who works at the youth center said, hey, we, we may have a case of human trafficking here. Now in the case of a minor, whether it's labor or it's, it's sex trafficking, you don't have to prove force, fraud, or coercion. So in, in terms of the burden of proof, there's, and to be quite honest, from an aftercare perspective, you don't, there, there are many, there, there are a lot more facilities in terms of aftercare for minors than there are individuals who aren't classified as minors. Um, so for, in that case, you know, we reported it, okay? FBI comes by because I know it goes when you report it. I know who it goes to. That's the head of a task force in Detroit. They automatically, the FBI calls the youth center and says, we need to come by and talk with her to see what's going on here, right? And so you, you develop this sort of network that, that can, can work here. Anyway, back to my presentation. I apologize. Difference in, in burden of proof for, for minors versus non-minors. The impetus from, for migration, okay? A lot of the individuals, in fact, I would say the majority, if not all but maybe one or two of the individuals would not choose to come to the United States. They don't, they would rather have work in their home communities. But because there isn't enough work, or because it's very violent where they are, um, where they've grown up, there aren't a lot of opportunities for their children, okay? This impetus for migration from this sending country, okay, is such that they want to look for other opportunities that better suit their families. And, and in order to do so, a lot of these individuals go and talk to basically sort of like a local individual that has means, okay? So there are a lot of these networks in their home, um, uh, basically their home states, okay? Or their home countries where they know who to go to if they want to migrate, okay? They've got to borrow money, okay? For two tries to get across the border, it's normally going to cost you between four and five thousand dollars which if you borrow from the wrong person, that can automatically put you in a situation of bondage, right? Uh, one aspect of human trafficking is called debt bondage or debt peonage. And so what happens is people incur this debt. They're, they're not necessarily the most educated individuals often. So they don't necessarily know how this works, how interest rates work and some of these things. And so we, we have some of these factors for impetus mig to migration, okay? Another thing that's incredibly important is their familiarity with the process. We had individuals that we interviewed who their first time coming to the United States to work had no idea where they were going or what they were going to do. And so they're easily taken advantage of. Not, not every farmer, every grower, every crew leader takes advantage of their workers. That was one of the things I, you know, you go into this thing and you're like, oh, these farmers are just taking advantage of people, all of them, whatever. But you, you talk to migrant farm workers 
who are like, they come back to the same farm for 30 years. These are, it's like they grow to become a larger family, right? Now that, that isn't every situation, okay? Because with those who don't necessarily have sort of those connections to a farmer, to a grower, or to a, an honest or true crew leader, they can easily be taken advantage of. So some individuals, and we heard this, a couple of distinct cases in um, Grand Traverse area, where um, individuals were clearly taken advantage of. And you could make a, a pretty strong case for trafficking, okay? So the familiarity with that network is important. Did they know someone who had gone north before? Did they know the person they were borrowing money from? Had, had they, or did they know people who knew these other people? Could they vouch for them, right? And so that sort of led to this, this vulnerability or, or sort of this, this ability to be taken advantage of or exploited too. The ability to secure employment opportunities before the initiation of the process. There are clearly individuals who come not knowing where they're going to work. There are others who are recruited, okay? So not a lot of people with some of the political talk that goes on understand that the United States actively contracts with individuals to bring them to the United States when there aren't enough U.S. citizens to work on farms or other occupations. Okay, so there's not, not everybody, and I, I don't want to get into this big long tangent about immigration, but like not everybody's coming to try and steal our jobs and criminals and all this kind of stuff. Okay, that's just not realistic. Um, uh, that's, that's policy. But when, you, when we get into sort of learning about actually what happens, what we find is that there are programs that legally bring people across because there aren't enough people that work in these, these industries. And Michigan as a state spends taxpayer money to bring migrant farm workers to Michigan because A, there aren't enough people that sign up to do migrant farm work. Uh, B, these people do need opportunities and they work extremely hard and they, they, they are, many of them can be relied on to do some of these jobs. So there's, there's a lot of these different factors. Tenuous road to employment. The ability to access transportation to the place of employment. Degree or famili familiarity of terms of employment prior to reaching the, this was another point that, of contention. So on the one hand, migrant farm workers would wanna say we should sign a contract that ensures a certain level of pay and work because what'll happen is if the crop goes bad, they may be out of work, right? And that's hard for the farmer, the grower, that's hard for the migrant farm workers. So what they sometimes do was then they'll go to another farm and work for another a local farmer if this farm isn't working out well. So they'll go. So they'll say, well, you like a contract because it guarantees terms of employment. But farmers have a hard time doing contracts because they don't know what will happen as far as the growing season goes. Bless you. Um, and the other thing that you'll find uh, that's, that's very interesting is they'll say, well, we want a contract because it's definite, but we don't because we don't want to be bound to a certain farmer because if we're bound, this is sort of the H2A problem, is that if you're bound to a certain employer and that employer mistreats you, you violate that visa or whatever it is, then you're stuck, you gotta go back. Or you're there then illegally. Um, or you're, you're not, you don't have sort of the proper documentation. The other thing would happen is farmers would guarantee housing. They would say, you can come and work with me. Uh, excuse me, they would say, you can come and stay in our housing, but you can only work with us. And so on the one hand, that's a benefit, but on the other hand, it's like, well, wait though, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Because if it's the farmers taking advantage of them, then it decreases their ability to sort of be socially mobile to go somewhere else, right? Um, access to everyday transportation to and from the workplace. There are, ca there are cases where people have to pay exorbitant amounts for transportation to get from where they, they're staying to where they need to go. All of these can be different indicators. Um, the nature and relationship, the crew leaders are very important, okay? In fact, in some cases, these are the primary perpetrators of trafficking because the crew leaders go and they'll recruit people from their home country or their home province. They'll bring them over and they'll find a farmer who needs workers. And then they're the intermediary. Okay, often these folks are bilingual, so they can speak Spanish and English. The workers don't speak English. So the, the crew leader can no, negotiate terms with a, a farmer for a certain wage and then pay people so much less, right? And sort of scam them there, right? And so that, there, there are processes uh, at the government level where this can be sort of, you have to apply to be a formal crew leader, but 
that doesn't always sort of happen and there's it's hard to enforce or monitor that sometimes so that that gets a little bit difficult too um, and, and there is also a difficult difficult piece where sometimes the crew leaders are doing things that the farmers or growers aren't aware of although legally the farmer and grower it can be held liable for what the crew leader does on their farm so what, what that led to was a lot of then farmers and growers would be very careful about who they worked with. Or they would eliminate that person. They just worked directly with the farmer. So that, that can be sort of a tenuous relationship too. Living and working conditions. We had cases where individuals stood outside with a, with a shotgun while people worked. We had cases where individuals, um, and there's, there's a number of these cases in the Florida with the, there's a number of cases with uh, particularly with the oranges and the tomatoes um, uh, farmers. But like up, up in Michigan, we had, I mean, we had a case of where an individual had a shotgun and was supervising people. We have other cases where individuals are yelling and screaming at people to, to pick faster and to whatever. So like there are these cases. Now, that's not everyone, however. That's not, it doesn't mean every farmer, every grower does that. It just means that there are some individuals who, who um, by force, or in this case, maybe coercion, um, um, take advantage of, of their workers. The, the other thing I'll touch on real quickly here is bonuses. Sometimes, with, particularly with the apple crop, which happens later uh, in the fall when it starts getting cold, um, individuals will stay on and work the apple crop, but they work under sort of a bonus system. And so they don't get paid, or they get paid a certain small wage, and they get paid the rest of it at the end. Based on the, the legal advocates, I that's not legal. However, it's sort of a compromise position because the farmer doesn't want the workers to leave and he wants to incentivize how much they pick, right? So it, it's sort of a, a makeshift sort of system, but it, but it can be a system that's taken advantage of, right? Also, the presence and condition of migrant housing, when they go out and do inspections, normally migrant uh, or excuse me normally growers are given about six months depending on how many crops they have and stuff like that about six months where the state says okay you're certified to have this housing for six months okay um, and they go out and they inspect it okay now those are only for registered farms okay there's about half registered farms and half are unregistered because a lot of people think well why do I want to go through this government rigmarole I'm not going to register my farm. Well, the hard thing is if the government doesn't come and certify it, then we don't know what the conditions of the housing look like, and that can be an indicator as well. Um, but again, these are, these are, and I had a question I presented up at the, up in Lansing at the, the Michigan State Migrant Farm Worker, um, like their, their annual meeting. And there was a, and somebody asked that exact question. They said, did you go to any unregistered farms? And I said, no. So all of my interviews are done at registered farms that somebody had gone and approved the housing at, right? Um, control over circumstances, lack of ability to secure a driver's license. This has been changed. Um, now there's a, there's a way that in Michigan you can apply for sort of a temporary license. Um, but this is something that, this is a, another sort of topic. I can't get too off track, but sometimes uh, migrant farm workers feel so, that often they feel discriminated that they get pulled over sort of a driving while brown thing and so they they feel a little they struggle with with that um, prevalence of visits to laundromat church doctor this is another sort of difficult thing I would say can you go to the doctor if you need to some people would have these chronic back problems right because they're picking asparagus which is just incredibly demanding and they they work you know sometimes 15 hours a day because of how quickly the asparagus grows and sometimes they have these chronic back problems. I say, well, does your grower let you go to the doctor? They say, well, we go to the doctor, but then we don't get paid because we're not working. So like sometimes it was, it was almost sort of will, it, it was on the one hand, there's no sort of, they, they want to make as much money as they can. But on the other hand, they, they may need medical attention, but they don't necessarily go to get it because they don't get paid if they're not working. So there's really no sort of like, sick leave or opportunity to, to go and, and, and change or to go and, and get a checkup. Talked about the H2A program a little bit. There was a huge case just recently. Scores of Asian Indians who were brought over on H2A um, who were then abused um, and exploited in terms of their job circumstances. So 
even some of these more formalized programs can be taken advantage of. And there are a number of those cases, uh, even with student visas um, and things like that. Again, great programs government has put in place, but unfortunately sometimes they're taken advantage of, right? Um, experience with human trafficking. So I divided these things up into sort of force, fraud, or coercion. And we talked a little bit, oh, there's, there's one farm where all summer individuals, their checks bounced. And they were told, so like the farmer, they, they got a check and they went to cash it and they, they bounced all summer, all summer. And the farmer kept saying, well, you're going to get paid, you're going to get paid, you're going to get paid. And these people are incredibly dedicated to what they do. They're very proud people. And so they, they trust the farmer. They trust the farmer. And then, you know, summer's gone and they haven't been paid yet, right? Uh, this is a case in West Michigan. Um, that farmer no longer... See, here's the thing, like, you could say, well, the farmer takes advantage. A lot of times, like, migrant farm workers will talk. So, like, they know which farms not to go to. That's why the networking thing is important. For those who don't know, it becomes very difficult because they, they often go to those places because they don't know any better. So, and the same thing happens with farmers. Sometimes workers that speak up against certain injustices, they, the case of exploitation get blacklisted and then it gets harder for them too. So um, there, there are some of those different ways in which they sort of... So anyway, um, conclusion, I'm gonna wrap up and then I welcome any questions because I like, uh, I like what I said before I don't necessarily like what I said before, but it's sort of like what I said. Anyway, I, I, tend to, I tend to learn a great deal and to process a lot when you have questions. So it helps me think through ways to move the research forward or questions to anticipate and address for, certain, for future studies. I did issue, there's a set of recommendations in my dissertation, and I can pass that along if any of you are interested. Um, there are also sort of these other opportunities I have to present, so I want to go and I want to talk to migrant resource councils. Because if people don't understand what trafficking may look like, and so some people will say, well, why am I going to call on something I don't know it's trafficking? Why am I going to call on this? Why am I going to call on that? Well, here's the deal. My response is always, you don't know, right? I've had law enforcement, whether at the state level or at the federal level, tell me, unless we hear these things, we don't always know that they happen. So sometimes, I think about it as a puzzle. Anybody like puzzles? All right, Betty, good. I'm a puzzle fan. My kids and I like to do some puzzles every now and again. But it's like a puzzle. You may have a piece or two pieces to what's going on in a certain circumstance or situation that they need. You don't know what puzzle pieces they have, right? So it, it doesn't, you know, the worst thing that can happen is you call in a, in a, you know, in a certain circumstance or situation. I always say when people call me, I don't want to hear anything specific. Obviously, you protect confidentiality. I'm not out to out anybody, especially when we talk about this situation, because these are, you know, sometimes can be undocumented workers. But I say you never know what this what this this is going to lead to. So you you just have to call the National Trafficking Hotline, National Resource Hotline, which is staffed by Polaris Project, and report it. I mean, you never know. You never know what's going to happen. Okay. Um, and so there's opportunities to present are important because the stronger the network of individuals are who know about this issue, the more sort of eyes and ears and people we have out there. For those of you that are you know, in the helping professions, you know unless you hear about a certain issue, you know, it's child abuse or domestic violence or poverty, I mean, if you don't understand the signs of something, then you don't know what to look for and you don't know who to talk to and you don't know some of these things. So, the opportunity to present here, I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, other academic conferences, I'll be continuing to present some of this stuff at some of these statewide trainings, which will continue throughout the next year or so. Um, learning partnerships, one of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to see Spring Arbor, and I'm not necessarily signing up to do another thing right away, okay, just to clarify. But the thing is, is like, I think it would be great to be able to build more partnerships with you know, populations like migrant workers and, and to, you know, to take groups to find out what this is really like as opposed to sort of like this stuff we kind of hear all the time. Um, future research, one of the things that I've, I've had happen is I've had a couple students from Spring Arbor say, hey Norwood, my dad's a grower. Um, you know, my grandpa gro is a grower. Um, we've had migrant farm workers before. If you ever want to talk to them, let me know. And I've been like, yeah, that'd be great. Because part of this isn't, is this isn't out to demonize crew leaders or growers or anybody. 
it's it's out to further empower people to understand this issue and to know what to look for. So I, I be I think it'd be great to talk to growers. I think it'd be great to learn more from their perspective, some of the constraints they face in hiring workers and how difficult that can be, um, and how that plays into some of these research questions as well. Here's the National Human Trafficking Hotline. You can Google that at any point in time if you ever have a question. You can call them up, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you could be confident about what's going on. You could not be confident. You just gotta make, just gotta call and 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 and, and let them know about the situation, about what's going on. Uh, it's PolarisProject.org has a lot more resources. And again, I just want to reiterate how thankful I am for the opportunity to present and for your attention. And I hope it been somewhat beneficial um, in terms of your understanding of human trafficking, particularly amongst these communities and within these communities. And I would be happy to take any questions you have. So yeah, Dr. Rawson. Just curious. Yep. Um, that's a really interesting question. I mean, when you think about migration and you think about sort of like these different studies, sort of intergenerational studies, um, I, I met several uh, kids of migrant workers who their parents, you know, and it's different, you know, with that, those family structures than it is maybe with ours where, you know, um, you know, I just think of my kid, my oldest one, you're not, you're not my boss. Well, like some of these, you know, some of these, I, so, well, you need to go uh, get your own house and get a job there. Anyway, you, I think one of these things we find with these families is that the parents and the grandparents want them to learn the value of hard work. I think something that's very much lost on a lot of folks sometimes, uh, they want them to learn, and they want them to, to learn. It's also a, it's a, it's a process of sort of cultural transmission. Like, you know, the Mexican, I mean, they consider themselves the, the people of the corn, okay? Not to be confused with that stupid Children of the Corn movie, but like, they consider themselves the people of the corn, right? Don't go watch that movie. It's a waste of time. So like, the, 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 they, they consider themselves the people of the corn. So like, part of their identity as a people is wrapped up in farming and agriculture. And so they want to pass that along to their children. So I did find, Students uh, or, or you know uh, teenagers um, that were you know this was their high school job in the summertime, right? I also found individuals who were going to college and their summer job would be to come back and work on the farm, and that was a very much a cultural sort of a familial priority for them. But at the same time, um, you also I also talked to some of the professionals who said I grew up working on the farm with my family, and now I'm a social worker working with this population. Now I'm an educator teaching the children who come up from Texas every year. Or so like you saw some of the, you, you saw it was all across the board, Dr. Austin, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Baxter. Yep. Yep. Sure. Yeah. I would say there were about 100, 100 people at the talk in Lansing. Um, probably two growers. Yeah. And so there's this tension there. Um, you know, um, one of the, the workers that organized the conference said, you know, it'd be great to have more growers. And they, you know, as they are introducing a grower, and the grower's response was, well, if you would ever tell us about anything, then maybe we, more of us would come. And it's like, okay. So I, I think, um, and also, the growers come from a different, not all growers, but some growers come from a different perspective. Um, and that even is generational. So some of the older growers have, a, have an interesting perspective on how to view farm workers. Um, younger ones are very interested in recruiting and learning more about culture and some of that stuff. So there's some differences there too. Now that's not all across the board, but yeah. Yeah, Al? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think for, I mean, that's a great question. And, and as you know, I'm sure it's the same thing with nursing. It depends on, although I guess nursing is more practice based, but I mean, th there are a number of definitions, right? The definition I would point to more often than not um, is there is um, the 
TVPA, which is the Trafficking Victims Act, okay, which was a federal sort of federal piece of legislature that has been renewed every year. Um, they define human trafficking as um, um, as a situation which an individual right is by force fraud or coercion by force fraud or coercion they are sort of um, exchanging whether it's their labor or their body in terms of sex trafficking for some sort of consideration right so this could be and there's a number of examples okay under sex trafficking it can be any you can see sex trafficking in anything from Asian massage parlors to um, escort services and all that sort of thing and the labor piece looks it's varied as well so that's without having to without knowing how to recite it word for word you can go to the TVPA or the Trafficking Victims Protection Act there are also other definitions depending on which scholar you read and stuff like that so that's one question second one yeah yeah Oh, I didn't. I didn't mean that. I, I sort of. Oh no, 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 it's okay. I assume this is the language of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Yeah. 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 Yeah, T Tammy, did you have a question or yeah, do you want me to? Yeah, yeah. I, did. I was concerned about. Um, so, if you think there's a bad situation and you. Sure. Try to tell them what happens to mm -hmm. the individuals who are removed from that situation. Yeah. If they're not undocumented, are you setting them up for even more heartbreak? I mean, what happens? That's an excellent question. And I'm glad that you asked it because it brings us back around to a couple of our other questions. The, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act provides that if an individual is cooperative in any sort of legal proceeding, that under that TVPA at the federal level, they are able to access um, a certain degree of, of, of um, benefits. So housing subsidy, help in the naturalization process, a number of these things, um, they're allowed under this TVPA to access some of those things. So it's an incentive. Because here's the thing, law enforcement will tell you it's very difficult to get anybody to sort of share anything because they've got so much more to lose than they do to gain by following through in some sort of prosecution or something like that. And also there's a, an incredible amount of distrust for law enforcement on behalf of these victims. And, and to be honest, from a social worker's perspective, there's so much from a, you've got to sort of parse it out in terms of what their interests are. So law enforcement, they want somebody to be held accountable and they want to get their prosecution. Okay. When I've brought up as part of task forces I'm a part of with law enforcement, if I've brought up ever having a social worker or some sort of counselor in the room, they immediately get defensive. And that's difficult for me because I want to not just know that someone's held accountable to help prevent this from happening again, but I want to know that the proper aftercare is sort of not only available, but it's being provided. So normally what I do, there's a whole sort of vetting process because there are some people I don't talk to and there are others that I do because I know their views on certain things. So, um, I mean, it's just mind numbing, you know, going to the house, city housing inspector. Oh, well, you mean when we inspected that restaurant in downtown Jackson and there were bunk beds everywhere down in the basement that we should have reported something? And I'm just like ready to come unglued. Or like, you know, law enforcement rounding up people in automatically deporting them without having any sort of idea that this could be something that isn't. And this is another distinction now, like human trafficking versus human smuggling. Initially, that impetus for employment could be consensual. So I could go to you in my home community and say, I need to, to go to the north, I need to cross La Frontera, I need to go to the, I need to go to the United States to find work. Can you help me out? And so you loan me some money and I facilitate that process with the coyote and, and, and all that stuff, right? On the other hand, um, on the other hand, I think, you know, that's consensual. Now, when someone along that process then 
changes some of the terms that we've agreed to or um, is now, you know, I've been recruited to go work here, but now I'm working here against my will. Then it becomes a situation of trafficking. So consent is the, the key there. Um, so when we get into some of that stuff, it, it gets really, so when the, you know, they, they round people up and then they deport them. And we've, we had the Jackson College Forum just recently with Congressman Wahlberg and the prosecuting attorney and the sheriff and everybody, uh, Vice Mayor Dobies. And one of the things that came through from that was, and Chief Hines said this, Chief of Police, he said, well, if we knew, because I push it a little bit, you know, like it's, these could be victims. They're not just perps, right? So, you know, the, the chief said, I really appreciate that point because now, and are, and are working together because now we know that something else may be going on, not just these people are here, criminals trying to get here illegally and whatever. So it, it's, you're trying to help change people's perspectives a little bit while also working together and understanding how difficult their role in this is and some of the constraints they face, right? Um, so that, that gets a little bit tricky in terms of, so there, I think you, you've got to be able, I think those are great questions to ask. How do we know these people are being cared for properly afterward? And that, that's something that has to continually be asked. Um, so yeah, sir? Sure. Sure. Um, hired in terms of? Okay, in terms of, I don't know the percentage per se. I do know that in Michigan, we've got like the top cherry crop. Um, we've got, we've got, there are a number of, of um, you know, apples were either one or two to Washington or whatever. I mean, there's potatoes were up there. You've got the east side that does, you know, beets and sort of sugar, that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a lot of asparagus, celery, I think for some reason, celery were way up there too. So like when you look at some of these different farms, Michigan is, is I think it's in the top, I wanna say it's in the top five in terms of migrant farm workers that come to Michigan. And they do, they ride these crop cycles. Um, I mean, that, that gets into how do you measure um, hidden populations. So that's tricky. Yep. That's right. It's, it's not that we don't necessarily have enough. It's more, and I'm sorry if I misspoke with that. It's more that we don't, like they will, farmers will be required before they go through that process to post these jobs in their home community. Now I'm not saying all farmers do, but I'm saying that they're required to post these job opportunities. If after a certain amount of time, they don't find someone, they then can go and say, we need to get these workers, we need, we need help with these farm workers. And then they'll go through a process with the state and then with other sort of hiring agencies. Um, but I, that's not always the way it works, you know? Because here's the thing that's tricky too, is we're talking about individuals being these farm workers and they're the ones to blame with this larger conversation. It's like, well, what about the farmers who go out and don't follow process legally? Like, I don't see anybody saying like, what's wrong with you farmers? You're taking jobs away from America. Like nobody has that conversation. It's always sort of the minority or the marginalized that get blamed for it. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, if you have any other questions, I'll, I'll hang out for a little bit longer and we can talk more. But again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.